Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of TDA Talks. I sat down with the founder of our company, Henry Gold, and we had a good discussion about, well, what TDA is and what we think TDA will become after the pandemic. So I think it's a great episode to tune into. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Henry. So for people who don't know you, could you just tell us your full name and where you're born and what your role at TDA is? Oh, my full name, Henry Ladislav Gold. Hi, I'm Gold. <laughs> Otherwise known as Henry. Um, I was born in what used to be Czechoslovakia. Um, the part which I am from is now in Eastern Slovakia. Um, born in 1952, long time ago. Um, emigrated um, to Israel, 1965, from Israel to Canada, 1960, end of 1967. Great. And what's your role at TDA, just for people who don't know and aren't familiar? I don't know. Well, I'm the founder, uh, I suppose the co-founder, although my original partner uh, left, uh, split from the company, uh, two years into the company. Um, and uh, since then, I'm uh, basically, I suppose, the director, the director and uh, CEO, or, um, perhaps is the right word, uh, but I just call myself a director. Yeah. Uh, what I do today, nowadays, well, basically they have a sort of the overall responsibility, I suppose. To be very frank, uh, my job is nowadays, um, certainly until March, was fairly easy because uh, the team was superb. Um, and they was, is superb. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they deal with just about every day-to-day -day operational and, and planning and, and so on. Um, so my job uh, was relatively speaking quite easy. So what is what is the TDA team and what are you doing uh, these days during the pandemic? Well, uh, what do we do? Um, a lot of running in a treadmill. <laughs> 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 yes. um, uh, trying to stay uh, as focused as possible, trying to come up with ideas, um, trying to assess uh, you know, uh, trying to assess what uh, what's possible, what's realistic, so when to um, start running tours again, what to improve, um, how to adapt uh, to the new situation, what we have to do to be able to adapt to the new situation, look at potential new projects, look at potential new um, um, sources of uh, funding, meaning this different types of activities, if you will, different types of trips. Um, so yes, we are trying to be creative, inventive, uh, um, trying to guess essentially uh, what can happen, when it can happen, um, and be ready to move in whenever whenever things do change. Um, eventually, they will change. Um, they're changing from day to day. Um, sometimes it feels for the worse. Sometimes it feels for the better. Um, and uh, our job. Um, is to be able to look at every scenario and to be able to move when those scenarios uh, come into being. What, uh, like when you think back to the first time that you organized the, the Tour d'Afrique and you know people can watch the origin story that we have on our website, um, and when you finally got to Cape Town, um, what were you thinking the company would become? and? And how has it surprised you? How is it different than you, what you thought it would be after doing it once? So our vision was that we potentially creating a very unique, long distance, tough um, um, bicycle adventure uh, race, if you will, um, open to uh, serious cyclists who were going to cycle this and, and compete for four months. It was the ultra, ultra marathon and we were ultra tough cycling events in the world. And really, I didn't anticipate to cycle much. Uh, and just a bunch of coincidences at the end, almost on the first day, forced me to stay on a bicycle all day. And, and then, uh, because our tour leader was having all kinds of challenges, I, I got on the bicycle the second day and so on, and then eventually I basically cycled the whole trip, um, which was fortunate because it made me realize that that really uh, um, the what the tour offered was not a 
the ultimate racing challenge, but it offered a, a possibility of doing something completely different and, and opened this to a different crowd than the so-called fit amateur cyclists or even the professional cyclists or whoever it is. That it was really more attractive um, to people like myself who are not avid cyclists at all, but I was an avid, if you will, uh, outdoors person who loved being outdoors no matter what I did, um, canoeing, kayaking, hiking, I just loved being outdoors. And I'm not good at those things either, you know, I just kind of <laughs> keep going, you know, I keep going, getting tired, I keep going. If there's a talent I have, we just keep going, stumbling, getting up, keep going. Um, and then I realized, yeah, that there may be many, many thousands and hundreds of thousands just like me who love being outdoors, who love being on a bicycle, who love exploring, who love seeing other culture, who love eating other foods than our own. So it came to me, it, it was very obvious that what we stumbled on was a very different experience than what we originally envisioned. Um, and, um, and that's how Tour de Afrique essentially slowly change direction and, and became what it is today, which is exploring the world on a bicycle. And I think what's also happened with you since the beginning is you've become like an example to other people in your age bracket. You know, you've, you've had articles in, in the press about your trip, the, the first one especially, but you've written many, many blogs and, and uh, continue to cycle on, on many, as many of the trips as you can. And so I think a lot of people in their 50s and 60s and even into their 70s um, see you doing it and believe that you know you're a, an average human just like the rest of us and and they could probably do it as well yeah and and that's how i always tell people you know it's it's amazing how often i would hear um, strangers uh, friends acquaintances uh, dinner parties where you meet strangers and said people would say uh, I could never do this. I could never do this. And I would yeah. have to, sometimes I would just smile and nod. And then sometimes I would really get into these debates where I said, yeah. well, you saw, you can't imagine how wrong you are. If you really wanted to do it, it's, it's doable. It's, it's easy. There's nothing to it. What would you say <clears throat> TDA Global Cycling was in early March? And to read a crystal ball, what, what do you think is the, the TDA 2.0 version after the pandemic <laughs> 2 point oh. uh well the first part of the question is much easier than the second part yeah <laughs> <laughs> the the first part really what was tda uh, in march it took tda many many years really to become a to be profitable um you know, we were covering our expenses, but we were certainly not making, it was a labor of love for many, many years. Um, by March of this year, we were in an excellent position. We sold out several trips. We were in the best position ever. Um, this is where you kind of sit in the back with your chair and you wait, what's going to happen now? Because things are going so well. That's exactly what happened. And I, you know, I joke about it, but in my mind, I kept saying to myself, what's going to happen now? So to be honest, by March, when it hit, um, um, we, we do have, you know, some resources that we can rely on. Um, and certainly Canadian government so far has been phenomenally um, uh, generous. So it allows us essentially to, to continue uh, into the future and, um, and be secure that we would be able to take advantage of that future. Now, back to the crystal ball, um, <laughs> prognosticating. Um, our guess, my personal guess, uh, as you say, I wrote about it in a LinkedIn article I posted, was that what we have learned so far, many of us, is uh, being outdoors is, is not only healthy, but but people actually enjoy it more and more, and they see that this is uh, this is a healthy thing to do. Cycling, of course, is the is one of the best way of being outdoor. It's one of the best way to travel. One of the best way to go to work and so on. So uh, there's been a cycling boom. Um, that some of it will last. Not all of it will last. Some of it will last. I anticipate there will be more potential uh, interest in what we do and how we do it. Um, now, uh, 
um, we also will have to adjust and adapt and to see what other options can we offer. So, for example, as you well know, and I have mentioned uh, an example, how to bring those people who are new on a bicycle um, and who are probably extremely intimidated of thinking about a, a cycling holiday, um, how can we help in educating them and giving them more information, etc., um, to take them to the next step, to make them feel comfortable, to experiment further, etc. We are discussing other um, adventures, trip, private tour trips, uh, people who come to us possibly uh, who, who are at this point worried about being in a large group. You know, we are a company, often I joke around that we are not really a cycling company, we are a logistics company with tremendous reach and tremendous ability. Um, and skills, how to set, go to any part of the world and, and be comfortable there, learn what needs to be done, how to do it, etc. Um, so those skills can be used to people, by people who are interested uh, in, in doing something that's kind of out of ordinary and, and, uh, and they need someone like us to help, help them to do it. You know um, very well that when the shit hit the pan, as we say, in mid-March, um, we reacted swiftly. Um, um, we refunded people who wanted refund within a week. Um, we have done all sorts of things. We canceled other trips. We have refunded. We had nothing but compliments from all our potential, uh, from all our alumni and community, how we dealt with the with the situation. Um, we are proud of it, of course, uh, but it's just an indication what we are capable of doing for in the future for any sort of a situation. And I think I'm proud of the fact that our team did it, how well they did it. Again, if there's anything I'm proud of, it's up to this point anyway, that the team is intact, the motivation is high, um, and uh, we're moving on. You know, life goes on. Uh, diseases come and go, uh, but life continues. Human human abilities and nature is is beyond one human one disease. And um, um, so I I'm optimistic. How long, when, etc. You know, that's anybody's guess. But uh, I think we'll be there whenever whenever uh, things are doable. You've uh, you've been doing a lot of writing since March and. I think your blogs have uh, struck a chord with a certain segment of, of people that follow us. What has inspired you or why did you feel it was important that you, you spoke up now to our audience? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know there's a particular inspiration there. Um, I have more time, obviously. I'm older. I have a very, uh, um, how should I put it, uh, I have a lot of life experience. I have also a... Uh, um, come, um, uh, my my family history was tragic. Um, I I lived with two parents who suffered tremendous tragedies in their life and had very very difficult life. Um, I heard a lot of the stories, um, and um, I also saw by example how they lived and what they did under stressful situation. Um, some of it rubbed off, not everything. <laughs> Um, and so I, I felt that this is, you know, this is what I should continue. It's part of, part of my heritage to continue under difficult circumstances and, and think about what, how I can contribute. You know, I'm not a doctor. I can't go back and work. Um, and the only way I, I thought I could contribute is really just, uh, whether it's within the company, within the company, uh, give a steady hand and, and also offer some advice to our community. Do you have a, a special memory from cycling on one of the tours, something that stays with you? Whoa, uh, what a question. Uh, yeah. Memories, a uh, lifetime of memories, many, many yeah, memories. Really. I, I would I would have to kind of maybe divide it between memory of cycling and memories of what happened when I'm not on a bicycle. Uh, in on Silk Road, um, I remember we were cycling. I was the last person with our with our camera person at that time. And then we saw a person selling uh, watermelon by the side. There are these huge watermelon places, and we decided they kept calling us to have a to have some watermelon so we decided what the heck let's have a watermelon i love watermelon so we got off the bike and they cut a watermelon for us but <clears throat> with the watermelon came two glasses of vodka and uh, <clears throat> and 
you know, so we had a vodka and we had one bite of one and then a second glass of vodka showed up and, <laughs> and a third glass of vodka showed up. <laughs> we were suddenly having a cultural experience. So, you know, those are things that, that stick to you much more than, you know, than the, the miles and miles of cycling that you do. Um, For sure. And there are dozens of those little encounters that uh, I can entertain at a dinner party for, for a long time. Yeah, and a memory I have with cycling with you whenever we've had the chances, you're a, you're a notorious um, collector of fruit and berries from the trees along the sides of the road. I always remember that. <laughs> Blackberries or figs or whatever you find. Well, interestingly enough, some of the best meals are always as yeah. you well know, street food or local restaurant and, or local person who invites you for dinner. And boy, and those home recipes that they come up with. I, I, trade, I trade any three-star Michelin dinner for a home cook in a village. Do you have any tips for someone considering a, a tour? That's been a standard question I've been asking everyone. But coming from you as the founder, it might be a little different. Just go easy, take it easy, but make sure that you're able to sit. It's not how many kilometers you cover, it's how many hours you can sit on your bike sit. I have to ask, um, maybe my last question, What what's with the beard? Tell us about the beard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just kind of dragged on from one day to the next. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, I, I never met my grandfathers, but they both, both had beards. Okay. Um, and um, at this point, I think it's, um, I don't know, it just kind of uh, fascinates me how well I can look. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I had for you, how is TDA different? Um, what does our company do that's different than other tour companies? And, and obviously, it's, there's some obvious differences with solo cyclists, but what are the differences and what's, what's uh, the advantage or the the value of doing a trip with TDA? I, I think the difference between TDA and uh, essentially and the rest of the cycling community is uh, there are many. Um, it starts from the style that we have, if you will, created and invented. Um, we, uh, we don't cycle as a group. And I think, again, if you compare it to what other cycling companies do, they keep a very tight control. They, you know, they often go as a group. Uh, they don't give you the freedom to go at your own speed if you are fast cyclist. I think the second difference is, uh, and including individual cyclists, uh, nat by nature what we do, we create new itineraries. Itineraries that, again, the no other cycling company has done before when we take on a new trip. Um, and we explore uh, both just the most attractive places to go because on a bicycle you can cover a whole country, every road, etc. You have to take a route and, and you cover that route. Often cyclists by necessities um, take the main roads, which are busy and often um, not as interesting. Um, whereas we um, try to create interesting itineraries, some, sometimes way, way, way off the main roads. You can do a lot of research on the phone, on, a, on the internet and books, etc., but you're very limited from that. Whereas in, in our situation, you know, we have scouted it, we have talked to a lot of people before, um, we checked things out before. Um, so it's a very different approach, different adventure. Another very huge difference is that the friendships you create with the people you're actually cycling with. Those are those are lifelong friendships. I have become friends with some of our, you know, even though they were essentially clients, if you will. Uh, now they're friends, you know, I never think of them as clients. Another different reason, as I mentioned, uh, and again, people who have been with other companies can attest, it's our type of staff. Um, they're problem solvers. Um, they may not necessarily be the most polite, they may not necessarily be the one who are um, treating you the way you are treated in a five-star hotel. Um, but boy, oh boy, when the shit hits the fan, when there's a problem, when there's, you know, our people know how to deal with crisis, with an unpredictable situation, etc. I think that's a key difference. It's, a, it's the leadership. It's the ability to think on their feet. It's the ability to, to be resourceful. Um, so again, I think that's another um, difference. 
Well, thank you very much, Henry. I appreciate it. Uh, we talk every day, but it's nice for people to hear your, your thoughts on these things. So um, much appreciated and have a good afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Henry, for taking the time to share that with us. Uh, for the rest of you, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel to be alerted for the next episode. And hope to see you next month.